Hi, this is about incorporating probability into the deterministic Everett interpretation of quantum mechanics. Uh, I'm going to be starting with just the purely deterministic, non-probabilistic parts of quantum mechanics, adding in one new deterministic element and arguing that by doing so, within the Everett framework, we can explain all of those phenomena that we typically explain using the ideas of probability. So to start, we're going to focus on the phenomena that we typically associate with probability because there are almost as many issues with theoretical interpretations of probability as there are with quantum mechanics. So we'll focus on the phenomena and we'll break those phenomena up into two types. The first type, which I'll call extraordinary probabilistic phenomena. And the example of that class that I'll start with is simply the notion that we do not observe macroscopic violations of the second law of thermodynamics. The, the laws of thermodynamics hold, and we have never actually observed a large-scale violation. Uh, so in addition to this objective property of that phenomenon, or non-phenomenon, if you will, there's also the associated fact that it's a collective phenomenon. We, it relates to systems with large, that is to say, Avogadro's number of constituents. Okay. And there are obviously many other probabilistic phenomena. We can just call those ordinary. Put those aside for the moment. Uh, let's focus on the extra, this, these extraordinary ones. Uh, and we want to explain, well, initially at least, their non-observation. And we will do so using a quantum extension of something that has a, a long history in classical considerations of probability, Cournot's principle. I'll use a term introduced by Robert Garrosh uh, in applying this to the many worlds theory, preclusion. It's a very simple idea. And since within quantum mechanics, when we do probability, we have a, a prior notion of how to compute that from, the quant from what's referred to as a quantum weight, we're simply going to introduce a rule that says that if an event has a quantum weight below a certain positive number, the th preclusion threshold, it doesn't happen. Okay. So this almost by fiat would seem to account for the non-observation of things which have an incredibly low quantum weight. Uh, there are details in terms of how one goes about that. It's not as simple as one might think, but I'm not going to go into those because it's more interesting to then see how we go and use that idea to bootstrap our way to all the remaining quantum phenomena. Uh, we start out with the notion that other quantum phenomena, we can, or their objective, the objective property describing them is the subjective reaction we had to have to them. Now that's not a new notion, but still that lacks explanatory power. What is the objective thing behind that? And so, we note, so we'd like to go on. We note that biological evolution is, this is the second item that seems to in invoke large numbers because of the geological time frames involved. And furthermore, there is a great deal of experimental evidence that in fact, the subjective notions of probability, and here's where the explanatory power comes in, Objective notion, subjective explanations of probability um, actually have exper actually come from evolution and are intrinsic. And I can't go through the experiments to describe those, but we have a complete chain then from the preclusion principle explaining biological evolution, which then explains our subjective notions of probability, provided that we can come up with a with a model within quantum mechanics only using preclusion, not any notion of probability that accounts for 
some model of biological evolution. We have a proof of concept model of that. And so this, this combined model takes the best of subjective theories of probability for things that actually occur. We know what we mean by it, it's, or perceptions. And on the other hand, it has explanatory power, and then it's all coming from objective things, the laws of quantum mechanics supplemented by this preclusion principle. Thank you. Hi, my name is Florian Huber. I'm from LMU Munich. And we are in the group, we are experimentalists in the group of Harald Weinfurter. And we are currently working on a double slit um, setup where we have um, one photon which is inside, um, which is in the double slit, and the, the which path information is entangled to the polarization of a second photon. With this setup, we want to challenge Bohmian mechanics. Um, maybe just a few words about Bohmian mechanics. Um, Bohmian mechanics is a, um, a non-local hidden variable theory, which is empirically completely equivalent to standard quantum mechanics. Um, however, the hidden variable in Bohmian mechanics is the position, and with this, Bohmian mechanics allows to draw trajectories. Um, this we want to do or to detect in our in our setup, and we are doing the reconstruction of the Bohmian trajectories by weak measurement. In this double slit experiment, we then have three different cases. Um, the first case we get when we remove the entanglement to the second photon, so we have no which path information, and therefore we can see the interference pattern, um, which is also fully shown with the Bohmian trajectories. The second case we get when we measure the polarization of the second photon before the photon enters our double slit. Um, in this case, we get this, um, we get this yeah, classical expected pattern. The third case and the so-called surrealistic case, um, in this case, we do not measure the second photon. We store, however, we store the information, the, the polarization information, and so also the which path information in the second photon. And we measure the polarization um, after the, the photon position was detected um, in the double slit experiment. And in this case, we recognize a rather strange behavior because the Bohmian trajectories can tell us, for example, that the photon went through the lower slit. However, the polarization measurement can tell us, no, the polarization had to be in, um, the photon had to be in the upper slit. Um, this, however, in Bohmian mechanics is not a problem because the polarization information is a non-realistic feature and therefore is a bad um, marker for the which path information. We then compare our um, which path measurement from Bohmian mechanics with the by many worlds inspired weak trace approach and in this case we have also we again have the three cases. In the first case, where we can see the double slit, um, we can see that the presence of the particle was in both slits. When we measure the polarization, when we measure the polarization, we can see that the presence was only in the first slit. And when we when we um, store the information but do not measure it, we can see that um, we again get a presence in both slits. However, um, the weak value of the projection are different and we therefore do not see an interference. Thank you. I am Per Arve. I'm from uh, Lund, Sweden. 
and I want to present this poster here about locality to coherence and why de uh, uh, the de Broglie-Bohm theory is actually a man the Manuel's theory. And a prerequisite here is, well, I'm going to discuss uh, decoherence, and for that one normally would need something like the Born rule, and so I have here the interpretation that the wave function is uh, uh, the wave function in absolute square. This density is, is given the position of uh, our system, and so then we can we can derive the coherence theory, where uh, objects, due to their interaction with gases around them, uh, get very well defined uh, uh, positions in different worlds. And <coughs> uh, the theory there say that, well, it's not absolutely well defined position, it's a, a, a decoherence length, it ends up, uh, which is given by thermal physics. And uh, uh, the decoherence theory then says if you look at many macroscopic objects that are initially in some complicated quantum state, that it will, decoherence will divide it up into different worlds where these objects have reasonably well relations spatially between them. Uh, yeah. But uh, as you heard here, decoherence doesn't give absolutely well-defined positions. So it's actually so that uh, the basis that diagonalizes the reduced density matrix is not the spatial basis. So uh, the idea that uh, the question of preferred Hilbert space uh, basis is a red herring. It's not what you should look for, but rather it, what you only should look for is uh, that you have these reasonably well-defined relative positions of microscopic objects. And we are a microscopic object. So it's just about that we have reasonably well-defined positions with respect to each other. That's what the coherence theory gives, not a perfect basis. Another important thing about um, uh, that, that the coherence theory gives us uh, uh, gives us many worlds, and which gives us that we have no spooky action at a distance. And uh, uh, that is a very strong uh, argument for many worlds theory. Now, what does this have to do with de Brom, uh, de, de Bray Brom theory? Well, what I want to advocate is that the coherence plays a much stronger role there when then uh, the proponents normally uh, appreciate. And for example, so um, in order to not show, see decoherence effects, because decoherence effects, uh, sorry, coherent effects are also present in this theory in, in uh, uh, double slit experiment and, and Maxender interferometry, etc. So, uh, even if there are particles, and only particles are the real world, uh, you still see effects of decoherence, and so if you of coherence. So if you don't have decoherence, uh, also in, in, in the uh, Bohm theory, you would have a coherent effect in, in macroscopic world, if it wasn't for decoherence. And that for example, um, then we have observation in, in De Bruyne Bohm theory uh, is also there related to a wave packet uh, getting more compact, more localized. And so you, you, you really have very localized uh, 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 wave function and, and observation is really limited there but also there by uh, 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 quantum effects. So it's really no difference. So they, 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 the proponents try to say that particles give very well-defined positions, but that goes really against uh, that observations still make it very diffuse. And 
So my final thing here is a critique against the Brom-Bohm theory, that the Brom-Bohm theory is so much depending on the wave function structure that uh, they have to recognize that the wave function structure of the many worlds define the worlds equally well as the particles do. So even if they say that it is the particles that make up the real world, uh, then you have the other worlds. We don't have particles, but only wave functions. We can agree with them that in their theory it's not real worlds, but we can then call those worlds ghost worlds. And these uh, ghost worlds will have structures which is very much the same as we have. So there will, for example, be structures that seem to think that they are have the name of Tim Maudlin, for example, and claiming to be a proponent of and believing in, in, in the bomb the Broy bomb theory, but who is a ghost. And so the problem is that the real Tim Maudlin who is here can't know if he's one of the ghosts or the real Tim Maudlin. Okay, so my name is Katrin Gerhardt and uh, I'm from ETH Zurich and uh, I'm presenting the poster um, that corresponds to the talk that Renato Renner, also from ETH Zurich, gave uh, on Wednesday of this conference. And we were asking the question whether there is a consistent notion of a past in many world theories that can be seen to be consistent with the quantum past. So this is our, our question. And uh, the way it goes is that we were asking what it means if we draw this uh, kind of branching tree in many world theories that people always uh, draw and um, we kind of uh, define some criteria that we want to be minimally fulfilled by such a, a tree in order to um, have a valid notion of past also in the many world theories. So these criteria can be seen here. They are uh, mathematically precise. Um, Renato mentioned them on an like, intuitive basis in the talk. Um, and if we look at these criteria, it's actually uh, the case that we can find one example experiment where at least one of these criteria must be uh, violated. And this is the extended witness friend experiment that um, Renato Renner and Daniela Frauchiger supposed a few years ago. And um, we haven't included the whole proof here, but the proof sketch where you can actually see that the, the lines corresponding to these many worlds past on their way at some point validate, uh, violate, sorry, violate the quantum past. And uh, this then will um, lead us to the conclusion that in the many worlds um, past scenario, we cannot find always a consistent way uh, to compare with the quantum mechanical past. Well, hello everybody. So. Um the, the idea which I'm uh, trying to introduce to quantum theory is this one here that uh, it, it comes from philosophy of mind. It's um, a, a, a unique theory in philosophy of mind. I've presented it in uh, some papers, the latest version being this paper, which was recently published in Foundations of Physics. The title of that paper is actually uh, pilot wave theory without non-locality. But the reason I've changed the title here is because we're at a, uh, a conference on many worlds theory and the idea which I'm presenting in the paper is a combination of many worlds and pilot wave theories. So in order to get this interpretation of mind to work, uh, I have to use set theory, and so it uses set theory in such a way that you can understand uh, objects which have indefinite state as being sets of objects in definite state. The, so uh, in quantum theory, we can interpret a, a superposition as being uh, in, the, in the theory that I present, it's an infinite set of objects which are in each, which are all in definite states, but which 
have subsets in different definite states. So the, the object which is the, the set of all is an indefinite state because to be in a definite state, the set has to have all its elements in the same set, in the same state. The claim is that this way of combining pilot wave theory and many worlds theory is causally local. So we get rid of the, no the non-locality of uh, pilot wave theory. Uh, th th and the way to drive the intuitions, if you like, is I use a thought experiment. It's a development from the thought experiment which I presented in my talk at the conference. Uh, we, we think in terms of an infinite set of parallel worlds, if you like, but na in, in my talk, I thought of each of these worlds as being stochastic. In the paper, I'm thinking of them. Each world is a pilot wave world, but what's different in them is that they have different particle trajectories whilst remaining observationally identical. So that, <clears throat> and this can also be applied to interactive interacting world theory and I, I think actually applying it to interacting world theory is perhaps is more attractive but I set it up in, in terms of pilot wave theory the idea is then Alice this, there's a single subject their body is the set of all the doppelganger when they perform a sort of model measurement what happens to this set it <coughs> it uh, partitions into a subset which gets result down, subset which, get, which gets result up, and the, the, measure, the measure of the subset getting, getting down is the probability of the outcome down, and the, the measure of the <coughs> probability up is the, prob it, 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 the, the, the measure on the infinite set, and that's, that's the point, it's a measure on an infinite set, so you can identify it with the objective probability. So, conclusion, I argue that it's plausible that measurement outcome probabilities are objective, that branch weight, if you like, is objective, objective probability, and that what it is, is a subset measure on an infinite set. So my name is Vicente Pico Perez. I'm presenting a poster on intrinsic properties in Boyman mechanics and many world theories. The main purpose of this work is to try to answer the question about scientific realism. What do our best theories of physics say about the world? And I'm trying to answer this question um, with uh, the concepts of objects and structures that are usually um, uh, included in the, in the discussions about uh, scientific realism. So, the first thing is to, was to define this notion of intrinsic properties in order to try to understand what uh, theories of physics are saying about reality. We have three, four different definitions, but let me try to understand it in order, uh, in the way I put it in the second line of this list of definitions. Intrinsic properties are defined um, are those that objects uh, possess independently of everything else that exists. So, if intrinsic properties mean that, let's move to a framework that uh, allows us to uh, interpret the formal lives of several different theories, which is called the primitive ontology approach. In this approach, the ontology of, an, of a theory has to be understood as something um, basic and constitutive of the rest of the uh, entities of, our, of the reality. This uh, ontology, this framework is due to Goldstein, as is also developed by Valia, Alori, and it assumes scientific realism and fundamentality. In this framework, um, the purpose is to try to understand which are the basic entities that populate our world, and in order to do that, I'm trying to uh, interpret three different theories. One of these theories is classical mechanics, the second one is Bombia mechanics, and in order to compare with another interpretation of quantum mechanics, I'm trying to develop this approach for many world theories. In classical mechanics, we 
um, we find that mass is an intrinsic property. There are other properties like potentials, direction, and forces, but it has this in common with Bombian mechanics, which is an interpretation of quantum mechanics. Uh, in Bombian mechanics, it's possible to understand mass also as an intrinsic property, so this could serve us to make a point about the continuity between theories and to try to keep a version of scientific realism that explains the transition from classical to quantum in a very intuitive way. Uh, on the other hand, many world theory has as a fundamental ontology only a set which includes the wave function of the quantum system. So it's difficult to interpret mass as an intrinsic property in this kind of interpretation of quantum mechanics because the theory is not talking about particles with uh, definite positions, so the mass can also be ascribed to the y function of the global state. So the main conclusion of this work is that um, trying to understand which will be the answer to the question of the scientific realism, if we attend to different interpretations of quantum mechanics and also of another theory, which is classical mechanics, we'll see that there is a property, mass, which satisfies the demand for uh, the, the definition of an intrinsic property that I told before, which is present in classical, both in classical mechanics and also in Bohmian mechanics, but is not present in many world theories. So depending, of the, depending on the interpretation of quantum mechanics that we uh, defend, will end with a different kind of ontology and that will uh, affect the version of scientific realism that we want to defend. And that's my, that's my work. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, David Oknen. I'm uh, grateful to have the opportunity to present this poster here. Here's the poster. Uh, I'll present it in a couple of minutes. Bell's theorem is one of the most fundamental uh, results in the uh, foundations of quantum mechanics. The theorem states that uh, in uh, an experiment that uh, can be described by two binary inputs and has two binary outcomes, th certain constraints must, uh, uh, under certain assumptions, very intuitive assumptions, certain constraints must uh, hold. Now, these uh, constraints are tested uh, using pairs of uh, entangled uh, qubits, and the results seem to show that this, con this uh, constraint is uh, violated. Uh, the question that I raise in this poster is uh, if, indeed, the experiment where the Bell's inequalities are tested can be described by two binary inputs. Usual, usually, a Bell experiment consists uh, in a system with uh, two detectors that uh, are designed so that they can, each one can be oriented in two possible uh, uh, directions. Now, these uh, two directions represent the two possible uh, 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 inputs for this uh, detector and also we have two possible uh, uh, orientations for the other detectors. The question that one can raise is uh, if I consider two detectors in a certain setting and now I perform a rotation of a pencil lying beside the detector. That is represent of or that this represents the chain, the orientations of the detectors in the setting of the detectors? Obviously, the answer should be no, because if it's good, then we would need to account for all degrees of freedom in the universe to know which setting we, we did the uh, test. Another question that uh, we need to ask is, uh, how can we describe the relative angle between two detectors? And then we notice that usually the quantum state of uh, uh, two qubits is described as a wave function like this one here. And you can notice 
that this wave function is described in terms of eigenstate, single particle eigenstates. So each eigenstate is defined as any other eigenstate of a, a linear operator is defined up to a phase. So here, in principle, this phase here has not been defined and cannot be defined only by writing it down. In, in, in order to perform an experiment, in order to define relative orientation between detectors, you, start, you need to start by performing a calibration. And uh, only in a few minutes I cannot give the answers and how this allowed to overcome the uh, results of uh, Bell's theorem, but I think that uh, this uh, a few words uh, uh, raises uh, questions about uh, uh, if an actual Bell experiment can be described by two binary uh, inputs. And that's all. Uh, hello, hi, my name is Yiming Pan. Uh, I'm now a postdoc in Technion. Uh, previously, I was uh, working in uh, Weizmann. Uh, today, my topic here is, uh, is about uh, weak measurement to project measurement. There is the transition. So we make a, a demonstration based on the electron-photon interaction. So that's, uh, that's the basic idea here. We want to using electron to measure photon or do a reverse way to using the photon to measure electron. So the idea here is we, we try to combine the classical electrodynamics and quantum electrodynamics, how they can, uh, can, can transfer from one to another uh, scenario, picture. So um, our, our basic setup is, uh, is here. It's a little bit small. The picture here is uh, we assuming the electron is a Gaussian wave packet. You can change the size of the wave packet so it goes to the plane wave limit or to like uh, the other function particle limit. And another another uh, representation of the photon state is uh, we using this photon added coherent state. Okay, this is a state is combined like a single fog state and a coherent state. So in some limit, it will go to the coherent state, which is the classical field of a photon. Or it can go to the fog state. It's a purely quantum state of, of, the, of the light. So now we have a full combination of the interactions. So for example, we can use a classical photon, which is a coherent state coupled to a point particle electrons. That's the case here. So then we can use in classical, classical, quantum, quantum, classical, quantum, quantum, classical. There are four combinations. So we want to know how the electron when is coupled with the with the photon, what's the result coming out? Okay. So the the coupling here is the normal coupling between electron photon, which is the minimal coupling we, we, we're giving here is A dot P. So we ignore the pandemotive term and we, we're working in the Coulomb gauge. So, um, so the, here is the result, okay? The result is actually very, very interesting because firstly we see one thing is uh, uh, from classical picture, when the electron is uh, present uh, in some classical field, it will get accelerated or deaccelerated. So you can see here the spectrum is shift, and this shift gives you the energy transfer between electron and, energy, uh, and photon. So this is what we call classical acceleration. Or in another picture, in, especially in QED picture, the electron observe the photon and emit the photon. So they create the two sideband, additional lob, uh, uh, lob sideband, which correspond to emit photon, observe photon. So you see here, we have a two picture of the spectrum of the electron. So that's uh, give me the classical picture and the, sorry, this is a quantum picture. Uh, and this is the classical picture. The most interesting things happen is here, this one can go to this in a continuous way. The reason is when this, this three sideband overlapped, the interference between them will suppress one sideband uh, and enhance another one, another side, then create this total energy shift. 
And this energy shift, we use the a weak measurement uh, formalism to describe it and find the classic uh, acceleration, the energy transfer is exactly correspond to a weak value of the, of the, of the weak potential. So this is a, a very interesting, surprising result, which we got is the classic acceleration actually give me a weak measurement of the, of the, of the field. So in these things, we develop this uh, formalism and give the result which is uh, even the classical acceleration in classical picture, classical dynamics, we can get some non-trivial resu result, which is the weak measurement. So the last part is, can we make some whole selection on the electron part or, uh, or the photon part? And we leave this to the future experiment demonstration. So here is the basic idea in this book. It's work and this work is now is submitted and it, you can find the uh, preprint version on archive. So thank you for, for your listening.